this is CITV. Hello and welcome. It's that time again. Time for some nostalgia. My name's Jack and welcome to my Throwback Attack podcast. Well, do I have a very special guest with me today. If you've been a regular listener to this podcast, then you'll know that back in the day, I absolutely loved CITV, watching it every day between 3.25 and 5pm each weekday after school. Well, today I am chatting with someone who was part of CITV for four years, pretty much during almost the entire time I watched it. It's Danielle Nichols. Hello. Hello, Jack. How are you today? I'm very good. I'm absolutely mithered, which you won't know what that word means, because that's very Mancunian word. <laughs> Meaning pestered by your children. <laughs> <laughs> if you pester someone, then you mither them in Manchester. That's what we say. Ah, I'm mithered. Right. <laughs> it's good oh. to hear from you and thank you for taking part today. It is good to chat to you. So uh, what I always like to start off with is the beginning, really. Um, so what were you doing prior to CITV? How did you, uh, what was the path into leading up to that point in your life? Oh, it's very interesting because it's just so mad. Um, basically, I was I was a always a performer, singer, dancer, always in the school plays, all that kind of rubbish. Did a BTEC in performing arts at Oldham College because my mum and dad couldn't afford to send me to a private stage school, <laughs> and um, and got myself into a pop group at eighteen. Um, and then the bizarre twist of fate is that I ended up getting fired from the pop group because I kind of they basically I don't know if anyone knows about kind of the rumors of steps but they kind of own you if you know what I mean when you're in a pop group so they control everything about your life and it was just too much pressure for anybody to have to put up with um and so I kind of Missed a few meetings and was a little bit cheeky to kind of get myself kicked out because I was on this ridiculously long contract with them that kind of said I could never work for anybody ever again. Um, and they just said they'd had enough of me and kicked me out, which was to my advantage. So then I started, got the stage newspaper, which is what you did back in the olden days, um, and started auditioning for stuff again. And that's when the CITV audition came up and I made a little... Uh, VHS on my granddad's camcorder at the time um, and got got to like a finals audition so as I stepped into the into this audition where I'd been whittled down to about 40 out of thousands applied um, a guy walks through the door and says I made your pop video <laughs> and I was like what and he was like, yeah, I was the producer on your pop video. Was you in a pop group? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, then I ended up getting CITV and the rest was history. Yeah. Indeed it was. And um, can you remember, um, like, your your first audition, like, in the actual studio? And, and also when you first met Stephen as well, who you presented alongside? Well, they, they were very clever about that. We did a three-day audition. So they put us up in a hotel and we did a three-day audition because what they wanted was a, a natural, unforced connection. It was very important to the producer at the time, a guy who I'm still friends with now, who works at the BBC in the Keys, uh, Salford Keys, and he lives at the bottom of my street, how mad that is. But um, he's a very close friend and it was Steve's choice. And Steve wanted um, a very organic, um, natural relationship. And so this was the way he went about the audition process. So there were three girls, one of them being me, and three guys. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember names of the other people. But Stephen and I just hit it off like two naughty kids sat at the back of a bus. We just triggered each other so if if I wasn't corpsing he was corpsing do you know what I mean so we were constantly constantly messing around and it was that natural ant and deck type feel that that they were looking for so we didn't know this at the time and we almost thought we'd 
we'd get into trouble because we're messing about that much half the time. Instead of doing the, the exercises that they'd asked us to do, the little uh, things that they'd asked us to do, me and him would just be messing about and seeing if we could make each other laugh. And, um, and that is basically, that's what got us both the job, that, that bond and that connection. And as he got on his train back to, oh, where were he living at the time? As he got on his, I think it was uh, down Somerset way, it was. As he got on his train back to Somerset, and I got on my train back to Manchester at Birmingham New Street, he said, and he always calls me Dan, he goes, Dan, I genuinely hope that you get it. I said, Stephen, because he don't like Steve. I said, I genuinely hope you get it. And that was how we left it. And then we exchanged phone numbers and, and screamed down the phone at each other when we found out we both got it. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, could, <laughs> you could see that chemistry from the off. I mean, um, and uh, yeah, it, it was fantastic. I mean, it was such a great era as well. Like that was my era of CITV, that Gas Street era uh, with the Envision uh, presenting. You know, and, that was the, the only blast. time that ITV had really beaten BBC on the ratings war because they had the broom cupboard, didn't they? Yeah. And so Stephen and I, for the longest time, ITV had never won the ratings battle. And Stephen and I changed that. And that was like, that's one of the things I'm most proud of. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it was great. I loved it. I was a regular watcher. And and um, I, well, as you can probably tell by Max, and I'm from the Midlands. I live not too far from mm -hmm. Birmingham. And I was very proud that it came from there as well. I was quite happy about that. I, I thought it was great. Yeah, we both lived together in Edgbaston, Stephen and I. We had a flat together in Edgbaston for just for a few months until he moved into his own flat because his the flat he was waiting for the tenants hadn't moved out and he and I'll tell you this he's got the smelliest feet out of everyone I've ever met in my life. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> fantastic! His feet stink and he knows it. <laughs> Um, so um, kind of go back to like the days I presented on CITV like can you remember your first day live on air at all I know it's a long time ago yes I can remember it and I've got a little story that isn't very well known but basically we were given I think two weeks and because I'd done so much work and had so many letdowns I didn't tell hardly anyone and there was no social media and I didn't want to boast about it in case I almost couldn't believe it was true do you know what I mean yeah so I didn't tell anyone at all and we went live on air and I've never felt as sick in my life and of course my mobile phone that was the size of a brick just blew up the minute I'd come off air because no nobody knew I was doing it um and the first week, I wasn't very good, let's just say that. And on that weekend, I was sent home. So we, we, went, we used to go home at the weekends, both Stephen and I are real home birds. So we'd live in Birmingham through the week, but we'd go home at weekends. And on the, on the last meeting on the Friday evening, uh, my producer said, you've got a weekend to get better. And if you don't, you will be fired by the end of next week and because I was that rubbish and he went he gave me a bag full of tapes which is why I always say like you know people believe that you're like born with gifts and all this rubbish I just believe that you make your own destiny Ed Sheeran famously said didn't he I got luckier and luckier the harder I worked which is true isn't it I believe so I took all these tapes home in my bag and a lot of tears um, and I got home and I sat and watched the whole week back over and over for the weekend and my mum's going you need to do more of this and you need to be more of that and you need to and I came back and at the end of that second week my producer called me in for the same end of week meeting and said amazing I'm really proud of you so there you go so I nearly didn't have the job <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that wasn't the case in the end. Um, and, I know. Yeah. <laughs> what was um, an average day like on CITV, like from getting in first thing and, you know, rehearsing and then, you know, doing the, uh, doing the broadcast? Well, we used to have a morning meeting at 10 a.m., um, which consisted of, um, we, we were never like on auto cue. 
We were never given written scripts. So we would be given bullet points and link lengths. So you would have such a program, two minutes, ad break, one minute, next program, one minute, break, five minutes or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So that's how your, your script would look with these gaps. And the gaps were your, that was our link time. Yeah? Yeah. So from that, so that was would happen in the morning. We'd receive that. And so we'd know because as well, because it's adverts. So back in, the, like, they paid for you to be there, didn't they? So, so the advertisement bed took priority over everything. Um, so adverts would never get cut short or, or jeopardized in any way because it was essentially the paying, paying our wages. So um, you had to work to this very strict time of say one minute 56 or two minutes 15, which my sister now finds bizarre that I can talk for exactly one minute and know it's a minute without any clock or anything. But that's what you had to be able to be good at because otherwise it would just cut you off. So you'd be halfway through a link and they'd just go straight to the adverts because that was more important. So, um, so then you'd spend the rest of the day writing your little bits in between, your little skits that were going on in between. And so Stephen and I would then spend the whole of the rest of the morning writing it. Then we'd have lunch at one o'clock till, no, it wasn't one, it was half 12 till half one. And then, which involved us going across the road at Gas Street at the little cafe there on the canal. I don't know if you know it. Um, and then we would come back in and we never had a makeup artist or anything like that. We never, have, we never had wardrobe. There was no budget for any makeup or wardrobe or anything like that. So we would then do our own makeup and costume, um, go straight into studio. You'd have like about an hour at that point to rehearse. Uh, and then you'd go live on air at half past three. Well, 3.25 to be exact. Yes, yes, I remember it. 25 past three, yeah. I always, yeah. I, I always find it funny, actually, because um, I said to my mum, um, me being such a big fan of CITV, um, 3.25 was the time I was born as well, which is quite a bizarre thing. <laughs> that is bizarre, actually, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, a couple of is. years prior to your time on, on, on CITV. But, yeah, I, I, I was an avid watcher, and then I found that fact out some years later. I was like, oh, okay, fair yeah, enough. That is weird to be born at 3.25. That is odd. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, uh, I like that know, little fact. I was, I was an avid, avid watcher of it every afternoon. I was always more CITV than... And CBBC, and like I said, I was quite proud of the fact it came from came from Birmingham. And uh, I've, I, yeah, I've been down Gas Street before and thought, no, oh, this is where they used to do it. That's quite cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is quite cool, isn't it? And yeah. it was all brand new to us, so mm. we thought it was brilliant. And especially the little outside garden and that. Yes. Which can I just say, everybody loved it when they went outside, except for me. Okay. Because it's so hard to, because they always wanted the sun in your face because that made the lighting better but you try not squinting and water in your eyes with bloody direct sunlight mm. it was like torture so they'd go oh it's a lovely day we can go in the garden i think oh no <laughs> <laughs> i didn't like the garden links <laughs> fair enough and um because it was like you know the first time that they brought in like live presenters in quite a long time um there was so much more. I mean, there was celebrity guests. There was people from other shows coming. Um, do you have any particular memories of that, of people that you interviewed? Oh, that was the best bit. So there was three people that will never leave me that I met at, at, at CITV in particular. It was Victoria Beckham, who came with Dane Bowers promoting her first single. It was Britney Spears, who came doing Brit uh, Hit Me Baby One More Time. And it was Justin Timberlake, whatever his, he didn't come on his own. He came as part of NSYNC. Was it NSYNC? Yeah, he was in NSYNC, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he came as part of NSYNC. And, I mean, he was he was a little bit quiet and he wasn't too chatty. But when he performed, oh, my God, I've never seen anything like it in my life. Uh, Britney Spears is just as beautiful as she is, as you think she is. Like, she's... She's just the sweetest, like, innocentest little... I mean, she was just charming. Um, and Victoria Beckham, 
knew how important she was, shall we just say? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just leave that there. No, she was lovely. She was lovely. <laughs> fair dues, fair dues. Yes, it was. It was certainly uh, uh, an interesting time on, on CITV. Um, and in terms of the the programs that were on, there was so many great programs. Did you have a favourite? Oh yeah, I. Not many people believe this, but I I stream on a streaming channel called Big Noobs with double I B I B double I G N double O B S on Twitch, and I talk about it all the time. I genuinely love cartoons and I still watch cartoons as an adult like mm. I have always liked cartoons so like uh, Cupcake and Dino have you seen that or Gumball or like, um, I watch I Clarence have you ever watched Clarence like I, I genuinely something. and obviously I like Family Guy I like uh, The Simpsons I like um, Rick and Morty I just genuinely love cartoons. I always have, all my life. Don't necessarily have to be adult cartoons, but I love adult cartoons too. And so, yeah, so Hey Arnold was one of my favourites at the time. Um, everybody loved, like, the Sabrina the Teenage Witch and the Worst Witch and all that. But I'm, I was a bit of a cartoons girl. Yeah, I, I, I genuinely quite liked um, cartoons. So so Stephen would, will not admit to this either, but he'd say... Oh, Dan, you just watch the cartoon and tell me what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be sat and genuinely watching it. Like I, I did, I was a massive, a massive fan of Pokemon, but I did like it. It yeah. wasn't my favourite cartoon, but I did like it. Good, good, good. I have to say, my favourite show at that time. I mean, I had quite a few, but my favourite show, and it was on all the time during your time presenting, was Zap. I love that show so much. Oh my god! So I've got a funny story with Zap. Go on then. So my my exec producer, right, um, used to say that my accent was quote too northern, and I said one time, I said, "Oh, he's he's dead stupid" or something like that, right? And he said, "Only people from Manchester will understand dead because no one says dead." Anyway, Zap came to my rescue because of course. Cuthbert Lily, he's dead silly. Yeah. That was his that was his saying. So I was like, I was getting attacked on the one hand by the exec producer for using what would be known as like a, 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 they, they basically don't want to exclude anyone. So they don't want to use words that where other people don't understand those words. So that's fair enough. But um, but I said, well, hang on a minute. Cuthbert Lily, he's dead silly. Why can't I say it's dead good? Or it's dead stupid, or and he was, uh, yeah, he had to eat his words after that, after that bollocking. <laughs> I understood it, and uh, the funny thing is, his zap was filmed down south in Kent, so there you go. It, <laughs> it was, was it show. was one of um, Neil Buchanan's productions, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Um, so here's a test for you. I know it's been a long time, but can you still remember the CITV um, postal address that you had to read out every day? Can you remember? Oh my god. Right, give me a minute. Uh, it was a PO box, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh God, it had Birmingham yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah. Oh God. <laughs> Put you on oh, the spot just now. give me the first number of the PO box. Four. Oh no, I can't. I can't remember. That's terrible. I can't remember the phone number, and we have to say that a certain I way. I can remember well. that as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, hang on, let's see. Um, oh no no D double yeah. oh god oh no I'm rubbish <laughs> no I've slept since then Jack I can't remember so it was sorry CITV I failed that test <laughs> it was CITV PO box four thousand Birmingham B one two J L was the post J L oh yeah. my god yeah, and the phone was. number was oh nine oh double one ten fifty ten we jumped That's and right, and you had to say 10, 50, 10, because yeah. you, you couldn't say it, and you had to say, all, all agree to say it the same way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, never mind. Yeah. And uh, obviously, you appeared on a few other CITV shows as well. Um, tell us about doing Mad Free, because I love that show, and, and Mike and Nigel have been on the podcast recently. Tell us about doing that. Oh, have they? Yes. So I'm still friends with Mike. I'm still friends with Mike. Now, I'm Nigel, to be fair. We did a summer show together, me and Nigel. Um... Yeah, so 
Mad for it was amazing because Mad for it was like this little step up from continuity to doing an actual show. So suddenly I had a costume and a makeup and a better wage <laughs> um, and was treated like a little bit of a princess, I'm not going to lie. So you'd have like a car. Because me, Stephen and I used to get on the bus. We used to get the bus into work for the first two months of CITV until it got so bad that we were mobbed. We used to get mobbed on the bus. Because in Birmingham, they had a fantastic system where you only paid a pound no matter where you went. Yeah. I don't know if that still applies. Obviously, it doesn't, but it did at the time I was living there. And uh, we used to get mobbed on the bus into work, so we had to stop going on the bus. We had to start getting taxes. Um, but that was the first time I was treated like a proper celeb, really. So, yeah, so I do remember Mad for it very fondly because it was all very TV. And when I worked at CITV, it might surprise a lot of people, but it was quite, there wasn't a massive budget for CITV. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was quite basic. Um, but yeah, I loved my time at Mad Frit. I met loads more pop stars. I think that's where I met Steps for the first time. And do you remember Cavana? Do you remember there's a singer called Cavana? I think I do, yeah. Yeah, he's what, it was one of those where I said, Hi, my name's Danielle. And he didn't, he's too important. He didn't need to tell me his name. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, left with my hand out, ready to shake his hand, feeling like a bit of a twerp. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh. I'll just put my hand back behind my back again. Never mind. Um, so, yeah, so loved Mad Frit, loved working. But I worked with Simon Amstel at the beginning of Mad Frit. Yeah. He was on about the first four or so episodes, and I love Simon as well. He's one of the funniest guys. He's so dry. And, uh, and I really liked Simon, and it was me, Mike, and Simon at first. Um, but obviously it was great when Nigel came along, but it was, it was lovely when it was, when it was Simon too. He didn't know. I both both of them I loved. Um, yeah, and I really and, and Mike was just a cheeky chapper. He just he just would make me laugh. He'd just do anything to see if he could make me laugh. Um, but yeah, yeah, we had a couple of little uh, let's just say large nights out in Nottingham. Let's just say that <laughs> <laughs> after the sh after the show because it was on a Friday, weren't it? Yes, yes. So yeah, we had a couple of big nights out on a Friday after the show. Yeah. Great stuff, and it was a great show. Um, so, you know, moving on to like these days, I mean, how do you feel? I mean, I know now you're doing your Twitch streaming and that. Um, how do you feel now that people tweet you regularly saying, "I remember you," and people are always uploading clips as well for you to see online? What's what's that like? It's always such a compliment, and I never take it for granted. And it's funny because just recently I've kind of made the decision to maybe push back into. Um, television again and because it's because my daughter died nine years ago and I stopped working to have children because my husband had the kind of job where one of us would have had to stop working so it made sense and it was me so I stopped working um, and then when my daughter died I just didn't want to go back to it I just wanted to be at home with my kids and now they're all that bit older now um, just just through COVID, really, I've just thought, do you know what? I can't, I don't think I can just stay at home forever with the kids and and never do anything else for myself again. So so it so yeah, it's a massive compliment and I never take it for granted. And I'm always grateful when people remember and I've always got time for people. Uh, there was a time that I would be recognised a lot, but that doesn't happen anymore now. I'm not really recognised anymore. But when I am, it's it's lovely. And, yeah, and I, and I love when people show me old clips and stuff. I, I think it's really lovely, and I'm I'm just grateful that, um, that that was a part of my life, yeah. Great stuff, and a part of many other people's lives who watched it regularly, like myself. Um, yeah, it was... Good stuff, and uh, you know, I wish you all the best with uh, with with your endeavours in the future. I hope uh, I hope that works out for you. Fingers crossed, eh? Fingers crossed, someone will give this idiot a job. <laughs> what do you think, Jack? I you hope get so. Anyone listening might give me a job. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. It'd be nice to see you back on the telly. It has been quite some time. So I know you did um, like Night Fever and that after that, didn't you? And a few other things. Yes, I did. I love that as well because like. I was always a bit torn because I really enjoyed the children's TV thing, but I did feel like I was kind of pushed more into the more grown-up television. 
as a like a natural progression and it's funny because I remember a lady saying to me in a cafe once oh maybe one day you'll be good enough to do proper television (laughs) and I thought what like kids tv isn't proper television (laughs) rude of course yeah I think I I don't know I I loved all of it as much as the rest of it but what I do love most and what I've realized over time is that I thrive on live I much prefer live to pre-recorded yeah. stuff. Yeah. Great that's, stuff. That's much more exciting. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I, I wish you all the best of that and and fingers crossed. And and thank you as well for chatting with me today. It's been really nice chatting to um, one of my childhood heroes, actually. It's very surreal no for problem. me. Very surreal thank for you. me. Thank you, Jack, for remembering me. <laughs> never forgotten, never forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> A massive thank you to Danielle there for taking time out of her day during the summer holidays with her kids to chat with me. As mentioned, she can be found on Twitch, streaming and gaming regularly under the name Big Noobs alongside her sister Jodie. Well, that's it for me for now, but there will be another podcast out this month, a special episode for Christmas, which will actually be my first ever group interview with some really cool people who were involved in one of the most iconic British kids shows of the 90s. I can't wait to release that. Until then, I'll see you soon.